Blog Talk Radio. Well, I bet you guys thought I was dead or something, right? I know it feels like I've been dead, hasn't it? No, I'm just kidding. You all follow me on social media, so you all know what I've been doing. Um, I'm back from L.A. Yay! Let me just say really quickly before I do all the quick uh, show announcements so we don't leave Morgana hanging for like 16 hours here. Uh, L.A., oh, 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 my gosh, oh, my gosh, oh, my gosh. Went to Beverly Hills, went to uh, hang out on the red carpet, did a little PR, did a little movie distribution talk. Some of the best days in a long time I've had in in L.A. recently. It was just an absolutely fabulous, fabulous trip. So I have to say uh, thanks so much to everybody who was in L.A. that met with us. Thanks so much to all of you for the encouragement and, and the very, very kind words about my dress, about the trip, the whole nine yards. Truly, truly appreciate it. So, yes, I am back. I'm back on air. I think I'm going to be on air three times this week. I know, right? I should actually know that. I think it's three. Um, today, obviously, is one of them, Morgana uh, Alba, who we'll be speaking to in just a second. So, Morgana, I'm coming to you. I literally just have some announcements to make. A couple quick things that I want to remind everybody about since I have you in my ear. First of all, if you live in New York City, I'm so sad that I'm missing this, so I'm hoping that a bunch of you can make up for it. My dear friend, who happens to work with the New York City homeless, actually happens to be in a band as well. And her band is going to be playing tomorrow night at Auto Shrunk and Head from 6 to 9 p.m. in New York City. So uh, Nikki Nerton is her name. Please, please, please go and support her. Um, she's a wonderful person, does a great deal for the homeless. So please go ahead, check her out tomorrow night again. That's Auto Shrunk and Head from 6 to 9 p.m. Number two, for my film festival, in case you guys didn't hear, you filmmakers, I thought you'd fall all over this. Yes, I have one more waiver left. That means you can submit for free. So if you're interested, email me, cin4251 at gmail.com. One waiver left as far as that goes. Number two, unfortunately, um, and fortunately, I should say, I am postponing my film festival from July to August. That's always a good thing when you're too busy, right? So look for the new dates in August. That means I'm pushing back, and I will be accepting submissions through April. So uh, the fee reduction has gone down, so now it's $25, shorts and features up to 90 minutes along with screenplays, along with student films. So the fee to submit is $25, $20 for screenplays, and of course it's always $10 for youth films. And remember, 90 minutes or 110 pages for screenplays. That's the festival. Relative to my three films, um, A Lifesaver, which we recently uh, actually filmed here in Wisconsin, it is in the hands of my beautiful editor who assures me that within two weeks, two weeks I can't talk today. Within two weeks, we will have it completely edited. Hopefully, we'll have music piped in by then. You know what that means? That means starting Nate, me, and my two other actors. You can actually see me on the big screen. Um, It's probably going to end up being an eight, nine-minute short film, comedic short film. Very, very cute. I'm very, very impressed um, with the work that we did. Um, Richard Schwab is in the movie along, of course, with Michael Gentile and myself. So uh, please watch for updates on that. Facebook obviously has it. It's a life saver. 100 Looks of Love, which you all know is my bigger film. We are actually going to be filming this month in New York City. Hopefully we'll be finished by the end of the month. And I am very confident to say we should have our New York City premiere still in June. So watch for details on that. And that's 100 Looks of Love, both on Instagram and Facebook. Saddlebags, which is my new documentary that's all part of our Film and Frocks tour. We are headed next to Las Vegas. We will be there the 27th and the 28th, and then, of course, back in New Jersey for the Garden State Film Festival, and, of course, we'll be doing an event there as well. So if you can't catch us in Vegas, do catch us in Jersey. And last but not least, I think you all know I am partner of this wonderful clothing company, so let me just show it out one more time. M. G Frocks. If you haven't gone to the website, www.mgfrocks.com, a couple of different things relative to this. Um, we're good to go as far as the shirt goes. I think we're good to go for the flask. I also think we're good to go for the bandana. So I think we've got our three products ready to roll. And because it's International Women's Day on Friday, I have something very special for you. So you need to listen into the show tomorrow to find out specifically what you need to do in order to get our special surprise for International Women's Day because the founder, Michael Gentile, has been kind enough to come up with a product that is specific just to us females and to celebrate us, period. Um, I can tell you firsthand because he's my partner. He is very, very good at, at honoring and celebrating and respecting women all year round, but this is a special special little item. So I will talk more about that tomorrow. So again, it's MG Frox. He's on Facebook, Instagram, as well as www.mgfrox.com. Now, you're probably all sick of listening to me. So let's get the beautiful and talented Morgana on the line and talk to her. Hi, Morgana. Hello. 
Hi. Hi. Sorry, I had to do like eight thousand and oh god. Well, did you just hear all that cramming of announcements? I feel like I'm literally uh, going to this I lineup have been of. There. I feel Woo. Like. <laughs> it's like so much going on. I'm like, holy crap. So hi, and thank you for being patient. You have waited for me for quite some time, and not just this last five minutes, but to get on my show. So I can't thank you enough for being so patient. We have a lot to talk about because I, 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 I know a lot I about you. If there's one thing I understand, it's the demands on a professional woman's time. <laughs> Oh, it's crazy. And you know what? I'm not complaining. I mean, I, I think you heard that in my announcements. I'm like, so not complaining about the fact that I actually have people that actually want to hang out with me and spend time with me. In fact, I think it's kind of creepy. I'm like, what the hell do you want to spend time with me for? But that's good. I'm all good. I'm like, you know what? It keeps going. It keeps me busy. So I'm very, very happy. So thank you uh, for coming on the show. And, and I'm sure you read my description. So this is the very first time I've ever had a mermaid on my show. My kids will be well, elated. Well, there's not that that many of us. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's shocking to me because I'm like, oh, my God. I mean, how many times does a PR person come to me and they're like, hey, I've got this client. And guess what they do for a living? They're a mermaid. I'm like, oh, my God, this is so badass. I can't not say yes to this, right? It's too exciting. Aww. But we're going to start off way at the beginning. Before you actually were a mermaid, we're going to bounce around a bit. We're going to talk about you as a regular person because you are a regular person. Okay. Some of the things you've done before this. Mm-hmm. Talk to me a bit. We're going to start right off from when you were a little wee one. I see that your hometown used to be Panama. I found that fascinating. I'm like, I've never met someone from there. What's that like? I'm like, that's got to be pretty well, cool. I'm, I'm actually, I, I'm American. I'm not Panamanian, but I am an army brat. Okay. So you know, really? when people ask me where I'm from, it's, 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 the question is what years? Because <laughs> uh-huh. I sort of bounced around the globe for most of my formative years, and I I claim okay. Panama and particularly Panama City, well Fort Clayton, as my home because everything prior to moving to Panama, I was too young to really remember, and my childhood, you know that that time period of my life really ended when we moved out of Panama. So to me, that's home. That's what feels like childhood. That's the house I grew up in. That's sure. that's what gives me that warm fuzzy when people talk about their childhood. That that's where I remember. Oh, that's so cute and so sweet. Now, you have mm-hmm. obviously an extensive amount of background, uh, whether it's dancing or whether it's aer- acrobatics, et cetera. So I have to ask, most children, when they start out at a very young age, they already kind of know, or at least have some inkling on in what they love to do or they're running around the house, and I'm picturing you, like, dancing and climbing on things. And were you just a natural from this from the get-go, or did you actually have to learn? Because I know you taught yourself how to pole dance, you know, because I saw the note mm-hmm. about that, which I find fascinating, too. But were you just a natural jumper, dancer, the whole nine yards? In retrospect, I definitely was a natural climber. I didn't realize it at the time that that, that was where this was going to lead me. But I definitely mm-hmm. wasn't a great dancer, though I thought I was. Um, I definitely <laughs> wasn't a great singer, so I thought I was, um, much to my sibling's horror. Uh, but okay. I definitely was a climber. I was always the one running up the tallest tree I could find, climbing jungle gyms. I once, um, in Panama... Uh, tied myself to the top of a uh, swing set, which now that I think about it was probably my first experience with aerial suspension. Um, I had, you know, brought some rope and I was going to flip upside down and I decided I was just going to do that. Mind you, this is like eight-year-old me. Um, And eight-year-old me not understanding knots, (laughs) tied myself to the swing set and the knot tightened, of course, under the weight, and I couldn't get down. And my husband, uh, not my husband, woo, that was a weird one. Ooh, Freud. My father Whoa. had to climb. Yeah, so we just skip that one. I uh, had to climb the swing set and actually cut me down. My God. Really? Yeah. <laughs> and then that's just now occurring to me that actually that was probably the start of this, but nobody's ever asked me that before. <laughs> Oh, my God, that is wild. Yeah, just because of the fact that, you know, it's only natural. You know, when I was a kid, I was like eight, nine years old, and I discovered, yeah, I can't draw with a lick, and I thought I was going to be an artist, and now I'm like, yeah, let's pick up the writing thing. So I just envision people like yourself that are just so heavy into all these multitudes of different performing, you know, platforms. Mm -hmm. This is just the norm for you right from the get-go. And more importantly, at the beginning, did you have any idea that you would somehow end up doing something relative to either the circus or dance or, or anything like this? Or was it just something oh, that just kind of... Oh, absolutely not. Oh, really? Yeah, I, the, it, well, and what I try to remind people, especially when I talk to adults, is that it really truly is never too late to go for your dreams. Because when I was 18, I was going to college for engineering on a full military scholarship and looking at a career in the Army. So it's a, it's a very different path than I had envisioned for my life. 
holy cow. Well, and the other mm-hmm. thing, too, is is I was just talking to someone about this the other day because we'll get into the, the circus thing in just a moment. But sadly, our society kind of, you know, you think circus, you think all sorts of different things. One of my cast members actually in my, in my movie is um, someone who came from the circus not so long ago and mm-hmm. continues to want to, she wants to actually launch a circus school to tell you the truth. And so I hear lots of mm-hmm. different stories about that. And we, most of us, will, you know, you think circus, you have all sorts of different fabricated ideas. So tell us a bit about that, meaning when you're employed by a circus, I'm like, oh, my God, I'm envisioning huge tents and balloons and freaky kind of people, freaky yeah. in the best way, mind you. The big colors, big lights, all sorts of crazy different uh, psychedelic things going on. So share a bit of that life with us and tell us, is there even a downside to that? Because I can't even imagine being unhappy working for a circus. Does that make sense? I totally understand. So the, the first question I always get when I mention that I spent years as a professional circus performer is they ask me, with what circus? And I have to explain, being a professional circus performer doesn't necessarily mean you toured with a circus. Right. I never worked with Big right. Apple or Barnum & Bailey. Um, I, right. I got married at 24, and I bought a house, and I didn't want to be on the road 12 months out of the year. So I was an independent circus performer, which a lot of professionals are, and I work in the D.C. and Baltimore area, um, and I do corporate events and and, uh, shows and things, theater, things of that nature that need a circus performer. You know, if you're doing Pippin, you better hire an aerialist. Um, So it's it's more local, but that's the biggest, I think, misconception is that people always assume that you toured with one of the big names, and that's not true for everyone's path. And as far as being happy, honestly, there there are downsides. The big one is the reason circus acts look so amazing is that your body is not designed to do that. Like, it's quite literally not. So the toll on your body is pretty extreme. And, and circus performers do take very good care of themselves. They're experts in their field. They know how to look after their bodies. But eventually, it's going to break down. Um, and kind of the aha moment for me that was one of the many things that pushed me more towards mermaids, which is what I'm now famous for, is that um, right. about three, four years ago, my aerial coach, my performance coach, has, she, she had to have a double hip replacement. She's 40. And I realized that if I continued performing as an aerialist like she did for 20 years straight, like she did, I was probably looking at a double hip replacement at about 40. And that didn't seem like a way I wanted my life to go. Oh, my God, that's truly, truly scary, as a matter of fact. And and that mm-hmm. poses an even better question now because you're speaking like that and talking about the fact that there are some scares on one side of the fence as far as that goes, let's say somebody's listening in because a lot of creatives listen to my show and they're wanting to pursue their dreams. And I'm very big on empowering people and engaging them into doing the things that they love. So if somebody's oh, listening me too. thinking you want to walk down that path and let's say they want to become involved in any part of the circus, let's say, for instance, is there some sort of go-to advice you would give them or maybe something that they should be keenly aware of before they even consider something like this? <laughs> Oh, yes. Um, Go learn from an actual human being. Find somebody, find either classes or find somebody that will uh, mentor you and you can do a full apprenticeship with them. But for Mm -hmm. the love of all that is precious, please do not try to learn circus arts off YouTube. That is not safe. It's it's a common problem, whether it's pole dance or aerial dance or sword swallowing I've seen or fire performance. YouTube is not the place to learn this because that YouTube video can't correct your technique. And with any of the things we do, technique is what keeps us safe. Technique is what protects our joints. So if there's not somebody who knows what they're looking at, looking at you and correcting you, you will likely pick up bad and dangerous habits that can honestly be life-ending. I can't even believe people would do that. I guess I'm quite shocked to hear that just because it's such a, and, and, you know, maybe I'm just an idiot for assuming this or naive, but I look at some of the things that happen. I've been to the circus myself. I've taken my children. These things are not only dangerous, but very daring. And they also require a lot Mm -hmm. of discipline, I would think, physically. Like you really have to be in shape. You have to be in tune. Really. Mm -hmm. And so I I just, I can't even fathom going to social media or or anything here to try to learn that. It's become very popular on social media, especially with things like Instagram, that people see a move on Instagram and maybe they've, um, I'm going to pole is one of the more accessible arts. So I'm going to use that as an example. So maybe they've bought a pole and they have it in their house and they see this trick on Instagram and they think, oh, I can try that. And they do with, with very little training or maybe they train by themselves or they've learned off YouTube videos. And it can be extremely dangerous because the thing you have to remember is that even at the top of the top of, of, 
of the world of performing acrobats, people who have done it their whole lives, who know everything in and out, who have the best safeties available and the best safety protocols available, we still lose about one professional high-end circus performer a year to a performance death. I mean, it happened a couple of years ago to Sarah from Cirque du Soleil. She plummeted 40 feet to her death, and she was a professional circus acrobat who had every safety protocol out there. So even at the best of the best, this is still dangerous. So please, please don't try this at home without an instructor. Oh, my gosh. Did you hear that, folks? That's huge. Oh, my gosh. I had no idea, actually. See, we're learning something, and it's been 10 minutes. Now I'm seriously intimidated of you. This is awesome. And the best way, I mean, I love, I love this because this is educating us, and that's important. It's always very important. Um, that being uh, said, absolutely try it. Go find somebody that teaches you your passion. If you've always wanted to learn to breathe fire, do it. Like any age, any, any gender, any ability level, any background, if you can physically do the act, absolutely go find someone to teach you. Follow that passion. It's never too late, but just do it safely. That's all I ask. Don't be the reason my insurance goes oh, absolutely. up. Well, that and the fact that I'm thinking to myself, don't you have to own a pretty cool costume or, like, a, a really cool wardrobe to be in the circus? Because I'm thinking, like, if you don't have, like, this elaborate stuff, I'm like, where the hell do you get all this from? You know what I'm talking about? I'm like, what do you just show up yeah. at the circus store and be like, I got no clothes, I got no experience, but hire me. <laughs> I mean, I'm well, like, well, it depends, where honestly, on... on um, on who you're working for. So, for example, Cirque du Soleil obviously costumes all their performers, but it's like that in a lot of companies as well. When I started out as a mermaid back in 2012, I didn't own my own tail. I was being costumed by the entertainment productions that I was working with. Oh. Mm -hmm. Look at that. I didn't get my first tail until 2015. Real? Seriously? Oh, my God. Yeah, my first tail, that was mine. I'd obviously been performing for years before that, but. Right. Oh, of course. And I appreciate talking about the safety aspect of things. I guess the other part of it is, is maybe I'm just blind or stupid. Maybe I'm not. But it, I feel like the circus is something that's become more of a specialty that you just can't grab anymore. Remember how it used to be traveling all over the place? You get see it all mm-hmm. the time, that sort of stuff. I, I just, I feel like it's fizzling out and it makes me sad. You know, that was like a staple when my kids were young. Even when I was growing up, I remember it. Is it just me? I mean, maybe it's just not. Well, there's been um, a significant industry change, and it has, in my opinion, my armchair economist opinion, um, two, (laughs) well, maybe three significant contributing factors. One was the rise of Cirque du Soleil. So that brought, Mm -hmm. when they started, they were groundbreaking. They were a new type of circus show. To do these large-scale productions and to approach it the way they did was very different than the three-ring traveling circus, extremely different feel. So that um, brought a new feel to the industry and suddenly more corporate events, which I would say is the second contributing factor, uh, factor, wanted to book that style of show versus the Mm old-school carnival circus style. And then honestly, the thing that I think contributed the most to the death of the traveling circus the way you and I remember it was uh, widespread animal bans uh, against domesticated elephants. And with ah. when you have shows like Cirque du Soleil that also tour that people can see, the draw of the classic three-ring style is really the animals, which Cirque du Soleil doesn't mm-hmm. trade in. So when the animals went away, the ticket sales plummeted, and a circus is an extremely expensive thing to run. Trust me, I know. Oh, <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and it couldn't sustain the sales. So there are okay. new traveling circuses propping up that are going for that more retro feel. But at the moment, we're in sort of this dearth where everything has gone to this um, acrobatic, Instagrammy Cirque du Soleil style that's more venue-based right. rather than traveling popcorn wonder of, of childhood magic that we grew up with. That makes me so sad to hear some of this. You know, I just, like I said, that's one of those things that when it's around and established, it's, it's a staple for a lot of us. So that's why I'm like, I, I really think people like your, they are, are neat because you're still here. You know what I'm talking about? It's like, mm-hmm. I love the fact that some of that stays so relevant, that people still rush out to see a performance art, which it really is. It is a, it is a form of performance art. And so, um, yeah, that kind of makes me sad. Absolutely. Now, i got to mm-hmm. revert back to what I asked about, or I was about to ask about, which is the whole pole mm-hmm. dancing thing. First of all, you talked yourself, which is awesome. Yeah. Second of all, you know, I was just talking about this today. I'm like, I'm 49, feeling 49, and I'm thinking to myself mentally, I'm like, dude, even if I want to be sexy and get on a pole, I wouldn't even know where to go with all that. i got to tell you, oh, it sounds extremely challenging, it. kind of scary. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, the sexy factor, yeah, but I'm like, yeah, could you just picture this body? Like, when you totally don't even know what you're doing, you're like, 
Hmm. So you got you to explain to us, how did you master something like this all on your own? And what made you want to, was that all part of it, meaning that you were training for something and that's what made you want to do the pole dancing to begin with? Or how did that happen? Uh, well, how, um, how adult is your audience? <laughs> so uh, You can honestly, say fuck. I... Oh, sorry. <laughs> well, okay, I mean, cool. So if you can say so, ass, um, you can, yeah, there you go. Honestly, my biggest inspiration was was strippers. Um, when I was in the military, I went to a club and I saw this one girl on a 22 foot high pole do this elaborate, bloody, back bendy thing from 22 feet in the air all the way to the ground. And I was, my instinct was, was that whatever that was, I need to learn how to do that. And um, me being the wow. kind of person who has a tendency to jump in with both feet and uh, and really go all out for whatever it is I've decided I'm doing, I went online and I just bought a pole. And I started where I was. There wasn't anyone to learn from except for uh, women who did it for a living. So I, sure. I found one of them and um, I got some advice there. And then I did the bad thing and learned from YouTube, which, again, I'm telling you not to do <gasps> because about two years down the line – when I went to my first legitimate pole class after moving to the D.C. area where there are studios where you can go to learn, um, I had this amazing coach. Her name was Tina. And thank God for Tina because she took one look at my form and realized that I was going to blow out my rotator cuff, that I was putting too much strain on my lower back and not enough in my mid-back. I was doing serious damage. To this day, my shoulders are still rather locked up. And have mm-hmm. been doing that damage for two years because I didn't know the technique. So you can teach yourself, but it's a terrible, terrible plan. And especially in the modern world where now there's, there's a lot of pole studios. Pretty much every major city sure. is going to have at least one. There's places to learn from. And if you can't go take classes all the time, go to a convention. There's pole dance conventions. There's competitions. There's meetups. <laughs> you know, make a weekend of it. Go to a pole retreat. There's one in Thailand. You know, go on vacation and learn oh pole dance gosh. while you're there. But definitely learn the technique and the fundamentals before you put yourself in danger. Of course, definitely. Hmm, now, that almost sounds intriguing to a certain point. I keep saying to myself, yeah, I'm going to get there, I'm going to get there, I'm going to get there. And I'm like, oh, my God, I'm so busy. That, that part of it is just being so busy, as you heard. And, and just mm-hmm. I'm like, yeah, mm-hmm. you know, I, you have to really be committed to be like, yeah, you know what? You kind of have to. I'm guessing that doing a pole dance in some ways is good for your self-image as well. I mean, it's not just a physical oh, thing. Absolutely. It really is. A mental thing, wouldn't you say? I mean, really, there's. I think that's the whole part of it that some of us struggle with. And in our well, in, in American culture, um, female sexuality is very much something that is frowned upon. And so, right. in a pole dance class, which most classes are 100% women, you're suddenly sort of given this license to to indulge in that part of your personality, and it's a part that for many uh, adult women in this country they've suppressed for years and years and years. And that can be alone really empowering to start to see yourself as as beautiful and sexy and alluring and feel yeah. those parts of your emotions and your personality that you haven't allowed yourself to feel in a very long time. Gosh, that's what I heard. Doesn't she make it sound so exciting and interesting? Uh, yeah, I'll have to think on that. Go, go take uh, – I warn you, though, it is addicting. If you take two classes, you're going to be hooked. Oh, my God. No, I don't need another addiction. Thank you so much. I will think about it, though, honestly. I've been thinking about it for a while, and I'm like, okay. But then, you know, I, yeah, I'll think on it. thinking on it. But she does this very well, because let me tell you something right now, because all of that pole dancing along with all the other things has contributed to some of the most beautiful performances. I've, I've watched you perform. I've seen you dress up. I've seen you decked out. And, oh, my gosh, we'll get into that. Okay. So <laughs> next order of business here. Let's talk a bit about this. You're very, very cute. And I didn't have nearly oh, enough you. time on Facebook to creep on you um, in terms of to, to double check and see. So, okay, inquiring minds want to know for the last hour, because, yes, there were two people that approached me. Is Morgana single or is she married? Only because there's two I people interested. I'm not going to lie. Boys, I'm sorry. I am very, very married to the life. absolute love of my life. He is a professional oh. blacksmith, and he used to be a full metal jouster. So I, I don't think you want to go up against oh. him. That was the cutest little thing. Okay, so we're all about the romance. We got to spell it, girl. So where did we meet him? Uh, and the, the big question. He's all. I met him in a pirate bar. Oh. I did. Get out. I was really? in. Yeah, there was actually when I picked when I was moving to the D.C. area, I picked my first apartment on its ability to be um, what I would refer to as stumbling distance to this one particular pirate bar. Uh, and because it was my home away from home. 
And uh, that's where I met him. Uh, and he was a pirate, and I was a pirate, and uh, his pre-mermaid life. Well, no, actually, it's about the time I began, became a mermaid. So there you go. Pirate mermaid um, worked out grand. <laughs> but we've been married um, for going on six years now. Oh, that's so lovely. That really is. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I like that. I like to hear that. I'm sorry, boys, so I'm sure that you guys are disappointed, but that's okay. I just had to throw that out there because I'm big on that. I'm like, <laughs> you can still follow me on Instagram. Up <laughs> yeah, she's still on Instagram. She's on Facebook and call her anytime for services. However, you just can't go there. I totally get what you're talking <laughs> about. On the personal side of things, I also, oh, I have fascinating questions because I, I took a couple notes here and I, and I thought this was interesting. Um. You have a love of theater, and I have a love of theater, actually. Mm-hmm. Um, I've loved theater for some time. I've actually written a couple of different um, pieces for theater, as a matter of fact. But I'm curious to ask you, theater would have been something I never would have pegged. You know, like, uh, I get that you probably love live performance, but tell us a bit about what you love about the theater, and when the heck do you have time? Do you even have time to pursue something that you love so much, meaning just going to a show? I only really have time in the off season. I'm booked pretty much uh, March to December solid. So uh, there's no time during that season, but um, end of December and January to like January to March is, is really the only time I have to sort of pursue those old hobbies. But I think what I love about theater is its ability to manipulate one's emotions. And I mean that in the best possible way. There's something about seeing real humans in front of you expressing uh, real emotion, interacting live, that's very different from the two-dimensional input of a screen. And in the two-dimensional input, you have things that you can play with uh, to a greater degree, like um, lighting and music and editing. When something's live, I think that there's it's a different input to your brain because it's it's people interacting the same way that you interact with people. It's it's almost evolutionary in, in our interpretation of it because there are no cuts. There are no edits. There is some lighting and, and occasionally incredibly good music. Um, overall, what you're connecting to is the other people 20 feet in front of you. And the fact that you can see all the moving parts and yet still get lost in the story is fascinating to me. Oh, goodness. That's a, yeah, that's a, I've said that a lot of times, too. I think there's something to be said actors are very lucky in that sometimes they get this automatic, especially with theater, you get this automatic gratification, meaning you know right off the bat if they like you, love you, et cetera, because it's mm-hmm. all right there in front of you. So I, I envy that quite a bit. I mean, when you're in radio, I don't hear until after the effect, like, oh, the show was lovely, or oh, you could have done this, or you should have done that. You know what I mean? So I'm always kind of in limbo. So it's kind of cool to get that that pat on the back, that whole, yeah, you're absolutely lovely. The other thing I think mm-hmm. is fascinating about you, besides the 800 other things we're going to talk about, You know how to talk German, and I'm German myself. I just said recently on the air that I wanted to learn Italian. And so I always keep asking people besides the Cliff Notes version. I'm like, how do you learn a new language within, oh, let's say a month without it, like, kinking into my entire schedule? Is that even possible? I don't think so is the short answer. The reason I speak German, and and while while it is diminished somewhat at this point, the reason I can still speak German is because I lived in Germany. And there's no way to learn Uh a language like total German. Crap. So much for yeah. that idea. I'm just kind of cramming it all at one time. I thought it would be more more appealing. You know what I mean? Oh, there's Cindy. She's got, like, all these different traits. And now she can speak a foreign language. I'm always kind of up in the ante, like, let's add another skill on there. Yeah, I think I've added oh, so many skills I can't even great. breathe. Yeah, but it's, it is. it's definitely, it's and it's one of those things that they've done studies. It's so much harder to do the older you get. And I think that, honestly, total immersion, that's that's why things like um, babbles and uh, – Rosetta Stone are are starting are some oh, yeah. that they're trying to mimic that total immersion feel where instead of translating words they're just giving you the picture and telling you the words so that it sort of sinks sure. into your brain in a similar pattern. But um, yeah. I when I moved to Germany um, I was 16 and I was an exchange student so I moved there on my own and, and was put up in a with a host family and I had taken about three years of German in high school middle school and I spoke mm-hmm. no German. I thought I did. I did not. Um, and part of the problem was that I'd only ever heard German spoken with an American accent. So speaking to Germans was, was very different. And it took me about three years of stumbling, uh, three, sorry, three months of stumbling before I got to the point where I was comfortable. And um, by the time I left, I was fluent. At this point, I would say I'm conversationally fluent, but I no longer easily read novels in German. 
Ah, look at that. See, Google Translate's mm-hmm. become like my best friend because I'm always trying to create something cool. And I thought I would be smart because I, um, uh, the person that I fancy so much is Italian. And so I was like, oh, I'll impress him and I'll just, I'll keep sending my thoughts in Italian and then eventually I'll learn it. So I've been jotting it down, like little by little, mm-hmm. like, I'm going to learn this, I'm going to learn this, I'm going to learn this. You it's not really watch working that well. Grammar, though. You know, the, the Google Translate, uh, especially German grammar, is extremely structured. And they don't, they don't always quite nab that. <laughs> Well, if, yeah, that's just it. So, you know what, my feeling is it's going to either come or it's not going to come. And in the meantime, it's just a bucket list thing. Like, oh, well, let's learn how to do this or this or this. But I figure it never hurts to keep asking my guests. Eventually, they'll know the answer to the question. Um, <laughs> now, from a personal standpoint, a couple of different things. Because obviously, when you do the kind of work that you do, I can only imagine that three things are a necessity for you, which means good sleep habits, good supplemental nutritional habits, and more importantly, good strong physical habits, meaning that you must hit the gym regularly, you must eat regularly, you must sleep an awful lot, or am I just nuts and you're winging it? Just I was a single one of those was true. <laughs> I knew it. I knew it. I wish any of that was true. Uh, no, really? this is what I do. Now, these are things that are important, especially their, their values I instill in my performers, but especially being – uh, the owner of the company, I um, right. definitely don't have regular sleep habits at all. Uh, oh, no. The one of the fun things about being a mermaid is when people ask us, people ask us about diet a lot and whether or not we focus on certain things or use specific methods. Right. What goes on? Um, swimming is incredibly uh, intensive, and especially doing it mm-hmm. in the temperatures and the conditions we're doing it in. Honestly, if you're a mermaid, you can eat anything, probably two of anything. Uh, so we, wow. we regularly eat just thousands of calories after a show. Um, and as far as the physicality of it, uh, cross training is important, but I don't really go to the gym the way that um, normal people consider the gym. Uh, I, sure. I swim, obviously, a great deal. And that's just Water. performance training and then part of what we do. And then I do cross train with things like pole dance and things like aerial dance which are a little more upper body focused versus the swimming, which is a little more core focused. So it's important to have balance but it's not, right. hey, I go to the gym three times a week for an hour kind of balance. I gotcha. Well, and the other thing I got to thinking about today was, okay, so let's say that mermaid lady here is sitting here and she's floating around, and I know this because we were just in L.A. We were in a pool, we were in a hot tub, and all I was thinking was, God, this chlorine is killing me. So I'm thinking to myself, <laughs> is there any health risk? Do you know what I mean? Because if you get overexposure, you oh, get a rash, you get worse. Right. So oh, that's yeah. what I'm saying. No. Like, how do you protect yourselves? physically from being damaged from doing what you love to do. Does that make sense? Sure. Yeah, so um, mermaiding specifically, it's people don't consider the health risk a lot. The major ones, though, are uh, hypothermia because mm-hmm. ca- air, and, right. air temperature we can't control, even if we can control tank temperature. And sometimes if we're in a pool, Correct. we can't even control that. Um, chlorine burns both to the eyes and the skin, uh, just general skin drying, but that's the, that one's easily mitigated. So I'm going to bring that one up, um, hair damage. And then the big ones are shallow water blackouts or, um, a loss of motor control incident, which can be caused by, um, uh, sorry, layman's terms, which can be caused by a lack of oxygen in your system from repeated dives or also by a hypothermic episode. So, and so, um, so ways that we prevent them. So we, uh-huh. when we're running our tanks, we do have safety protocols in place to handle things like temperature changes. Um, we can post a safety on the top of our tank where they're still not seen by the audience should there be an issue there. Uh, we don't require anyone to risk their health in anything other than a performance situation. So if we're training and it's just practice and we're in a chlorinated pool, goggles, mask, whatever makes you happy. Uh, my personal nightmare is a fatal brain amoeba. So at this point, I don't flood my sinuses in an uncontrolled water environment because uh, that, that just sounds like a horrible way to go. And, um, as oh, far my as the God. Chlorine, there's, uh, there's ways to neutralize it. So you can do certain uh, hair baths and skin baths immediately after exiting in order to neutralize the, the chlorine that's still on your skin and body. And for the eyes, we use gel drops before we go in the water, and we use both an eye wash and rewriting drops after the water. But the biggest thing that we do to protect our health is that we are mostly tank performers. What Circus Siren Pod is famous for is really our three travel tanks. And they're, um, they're spectacular, but they also mean that we can control our water environment. So we perform in salt water or fresh water. 
We do not chlorinate our tanks because when your eyes are open, when you're flooding your sinuses over and over again, the more you can do to protect your health, the better. Wow. This almost sounds as exciting as it does actually scary when you think about some of that. Does that ever detour you from wanting to take a dip in there? Because, frankly, some of this does not even sound remotely enticing. It just sounds, like I said, very, very intimidating. Well, we joke a lot that uh, mermaiding is only glamorous from the outside. From the outside, we look like water goddesses, and from the inside, we're like half drowned oh. and our eyes burn. It's it's not pretty on the inside. But oh my god, I think it's like I think it's like anything else. You know, if you if you speak to an equestrian, they'll they'll maybe um, good naturedly complain about you know how their horse is a jerk or it threw them this day or you know they had to spend three hours mucking stalls or they were up every morning at 5 a.m. to feed the horses. But at the end of the day, they love what they do so much that the work that goes into it is 100% worth it. And it's it's no different with mermaiding. I kind of figured that, definitely. And the other thing, too, is clearly most of us are are very familiar with what a a mermaid looks like either in or out of the water. So clearly you have an entire um, outfit that you are wearing. So my question is, is, is that tailored to some effect purposely so that it can detour some of those elements you're speaking about, whether it's chlorine or something to that effect. Is it is it a good enough for, I mean, decent enough protection, I should say, to detour some of these elements or, or it's still leaving you at risk to some degree? I would say that it doesn't really do much in the way of protection. The one exception is that a number of tails on the market today are neoprene or neoprene lined, which can add a layer of warmth. But even then, that layer of warmth is only from the waist down, whereas all your vital organs are from the waist up. So uh, while it might help slightly, it's it's not what I would consider a significant advantage. Okay. I've got gotcha. you. Now, I'm going to keep picking your brain on this because this is so fascinating. No, please. Because for like a hot second, I was like, there's two things. I, I just said the other day to my partner, I was like, I would love to try to be a showgirl for a day just because I find it fascinating. Oh, being a so showgirl is amazing. Mer- well, yeah, but then they have bodies for it, honey. I'm almost 50. They took a good look at me. Yeah, right. But it was a nice spot for like three seconds. And and the mermaid thing, when I was looking at it, I'm like, oh, this sounds so fun. And and now I'm talking to you and I'm petrified and that's never going to happen. So I'm going to keep picking well, your brain because I want to learn more about this because it's so fascinating. What I fascinating. that, though, is that mermaid is truly for everything. You know, I'm coming at it from the angle of being a professional mermaid where this is how I make my living. I perform all over the place. However, there is a thriving, just absolutely thriving hobbyist community. And the great thing about mermaiding is it's incredibly inclusive. Any any age, any race, any socioeconomic background, you can find groups on Facebook of people who just meet up and swim as mermaids. And they're some of the most welcoming people I've ever met in my life. So while it may not be for you professionally, it's definitely something you can pursue as a hobby. That is just, that is lovely. I have to ask this because you said it mm-hmm. is for everybody. Now, I noticed that you have a team of eight performers, so everyone is, is both free diving certified as well as um, everyone is uh, certified as a lifeguard. Now, is that just a status mm-hmm. quo among the industry or is that just what you require, meaning if, if people are going to work for you or with you? So not only is that not the norm in the industry, I hold everyone to a much higher standard, but even that team of eight performers is my elite team within my company. Um, We, Uh, uh, so there's actually, there's 19 mermaids and one merman currently on my roster. And the elite team is specifically trained to be able to do things like synchronized swimming shows and aquariums, which all require a much greater knowledge of, things like wildlife. So stuff I don't list because it's not a certification is we actually have a um, marine biologist who consults and trains us on ethical interactions with wildlife, things like that. And this is the, the upper echelon. So I would compare it to the difference between being a Victoria's Secret model or a Victoria's Secret angel. And if, by some chance, and again, these are I don't know if these sound like dumb questions, and forgive me, but I'm not mermaid. No, smart. <laughs> so I'm like, I'm trying to get to this. So here you are, you have your performers, of course, and let's say they, they get free diving certified. I kind of get what free diving means mm-hmm. because it's obvious that not only do you have to swim well, but you have to be prepared for emergency situations. I mean, fooling around in a pool is one thing, but if literally something happens out of your control while you're performing, what kind of damage control do you or can you do? Do you know what I'm saying? Because you can prepare 100% sure. for a show, 
all of a sudden something happens. Mm -hmm. So is there like a cue, a word, a gesture? I'm just trying to play this in my head. Like, how do you keep yourself ultra safe when dealing with elements like that? So the good, the, the big thing is we never, we're never alone. There's always some sort of support staff with legs that can assist in the case of an emergency. We call them our wranglers for the most part, and they are just a wonderful okay. group of um, staff members that are hybrid between being security staff and being performers themselves as pirates to, to talk through the show and keep people engaged and keep us safe. So we do have a number of hand gestures. Code words are hard when you're underwater, um, but there are a couple hand gestures that are vague enough that we can roll them into a performance, but also obvious enough to the people looking for them that basically say, I, I need out. I need out right now. Something's wrong. Come help me. And we have protocols yeah. in place for how to handle that without wrecking or upsetting the show. And then the biggest thing sure. we do to protect our performance quality and protect us against when things could go wrong is we're never pushing our limits when we perform. Pushing your limits are what you do in practice, going for that longer breath hold, that deeper dive, going for new tricks. These are things you do when you've got safeties there, when you're under ideal conditions, and when you're pushing your body to perform better and better and better. But when it comes to performing, mm -hmm. you, you only do what you know you can nail 100% of the time. And yes, while something could go horrifically wrong, we have enough controls in place that the odds of that are very low. So as so long as you are performing within your ability set, odds are that's mm -hmm. not going to be an issue. Okay, good deal. And uh, obviously the other thing that I want to talk about is is that when you're getting into this particular tank, now let's say obviously you've been doing this since 2012, and here we are now seven years later. Mm -hmm. So when you're getting into this tank um, for the very first time, let's let's kind of walk us through there. Is there a sense of adrenaline as well as just some sort oh, of God, yes. excitement that goes in? What goes through your brain when you're first going into this? And then exactly, just specifically time-wise, how long does it take from that first dip in there and how long you're actually in there before it becomes, okay, I feel more comfortable, I'm more adjusted, that initial nervousness wears off. I just want to kind of take us through that process because most of us are never going to jump in there and do this. <laughs> so most of my performers no longer get, get nervous before the first set, but they do get excited because we are truly magical for children. And it's mm -hmm. what I love about what we do, what I love about this particular specialty more than aerial dance or, or fire or any of the other things I've done in my career, is that we're not only magical for children because for them, oh, it's a real mermaid, but we're magical for adults because they can kind of pick up on what's going into this and – um it also sort of reminds them that, hey, there are people who actually grew up to be professional mermaids, for real. They're right in front of you. And it, it kind of lets yeah. people believe in their dreams again. So there's a lot of excitement when you're first getting in the tank that you know you're about to blow some minds, frankly. <laughs> um, and that's awesome. Normally, how it sort of happens is you get on the top of the tank uh, where we have like a curtained off area that is tied into the set that we can't go up stairs and a tail so you have to get changed on the top of the tank and then mm -hmm. whoever your sister is in the tank will already have popped her head up and then like oh hi okay you're coming in so you've got that, <laughs> that little connection of family and then most of us sit our ta our fluke goes in first the bottom of the tail and we wave it around and you start to hear the like oh mommy there's another one like oh she's gonna get this mm -hmm. look at the green one or whatever so you're starting to get that that bit of anticipation and then most of us like to make an entrance like we're not sliding gently and like lowering ourselves like angels it is plop splash underwater straight to the glass you know big big entrance and and that's because it's, it's awe-inspiring people love it and so then now it's you and another performer in the tank our tank does hold two comfortably so you'll both be underwater that's a great photo op you'll both surface and you'll kind of look at each other and be like oh should we do twin backflips or should we do you know a Die, you know, whatever trick you want to do with the other girl. And then people do a couple things together. And for us, that's playtime. And I think that's what really dissipates the nerves is we get this chance to just be there with another performer that we love and cherish and get to do stuff that we don't always get to do because you only really have that sort of five minute changeover where you're in the tank with another artist. And then by the time sure. the former mermaid leaves, you're already settled and you're good to go for your 45 minute or one hour set, depending on what we're doing. Yes, exactly. And and the other thing I'm thinking about is because, well, my kids are older now, so I probably wouldn't scare them so much, but I'm thinking if you've got a younger audience, have you ever had somebody react less than favorably? Meaning, you know, you've got somebody who's yeah. younger and it might be a little scary to them, like, oh, my gosh, that's kind of creepy. Because you know what? You guys, 
but you know, you look beautiful in a picture, but I'm not going to lie. I'm going to guess if I'm a smaller child, I'm thinking, oh my God, they're huge and this big mermaid. And is it ever intimidating to the little ones? And they're kind of like, yeah, yeah. I'm not digging and that. you hit the okay. you hit the nail on the head. It's because we're huge. Uh, in in my tail, right. I'm nearly ten feet long. And so right. it's um it's the same reaction I've gotten as a stilt walker. Actually, it's crazy how similar the two are. But right around the age of like, I'd say two to four, two to three and a half mm-hmm. in there, there's a certain level where they have seen enough of the world to understand that this is wrong. Like the proportions mm-hmm. are wrong. Something here is not not correct. But they're not old enough to understand it's a stilt walker or it's a mermaid. They're still young enough where all that is computing is like this is not right. And so we do get that reaction. Um, Occasionally a child will cry. Uh, For the most part, that's like a one in 500 scenario maybe. (laughs) And (laughs) our girls are all very experienced with working with children. Almost all of them have extensive child performance experience. So they're all, right. so in the event that the parent doesn't just want to take that child away, they still want that picture or whatever, uh, they're all very, very good at adapting in the moment and doing peekaboo faces or, oh, we're going to make fishy faces or doing something cute that will get the parent that photo so that they're happy, but also calm the child down and make this a good memory and not a traumatic one. Oh, of course, because you don't want to be traumatic to anyone. I totally get that, of course. No. Um I noticed that there's a variety of different things that you offer them. and But first, I want to ask this question because I am so surprised that I'm not seeing it on a motorcycle. You obviously have no fear whatsoever, which I'm similar to myself. Because let's see, folks. First of all, she's an aerialist. She's a tank performer. She's been a circus artist. And get this, fire performer. I'm thinking to myself, are you insane? Fire performer. I'm it. like, yeah. I, I don't know if you had a death wish. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, Fire performer. So I'm thinking, hmm, how do we practice for mm-hmm. that, I wonder? Uh, duh. So um, carefully, let's talk a bit about that. I got. I have to ask about the fire performer thing because I'm like, mm-hmm. yeah, I mean, are you burnt? A lot? I mean, I don't know how you people do this because I watch people do this all the time, and I'm like, how do they not have blisters? I mean, I can't even walk. I cannot walk a straight line for like a mile, drunk or not, by the way, without like falling down, tripping on something, and I'm like, how do you walk away oh, the fire like is not with no burn? <laughs> no, it's not. Well, honestly, course, it starts, with, it it starts it. with respecting it. It really does. It starts with really respecting that this is dangerous and it will never not be dangerous. And then sure. you don't start by lighting things on fire ever. So if you're going to do poi, which is the, the balls on the ends of ropes that people spin around that are on fire, you start out mm-hmm. with ones that aren't on fire. And you do it for ages I mean, ages. I can't say like, oh, six months or a year because it all depends on how much you practice and how quickly you pick it up. But before you light that on fire, you want to be really sure you're not going to hit yourself. And then also when you do, when it does come to lighting things on fire, there are precautions we take. Um, One, a big one is you don't use any hairsprays or perfumes because those are flammable. Um, You do, you wear your hair up typically, except for the one time I wore my hair down for a performance and did light my hair on fire. Um, oh to be fair, I would also lit me on fire, but that part was intentional. I was literally burning off a costume mid-performance. It's one of my favorites. Anyway, um, but the oh uh, my god, did you hear that? Post? Did you just say you did? You, did you just say you lit yourself on fire? Yeah, a little bit while upside down and in the air. And I and that's me not drinking, so I didn't make that up, folks. Okay, I literally haven't had a bevy yet, and she's talking about starting her on fire. So what okay. I say is that when you do fire performance, you make sure that you don't wear synthetic fabrics. You want to wear preferably flame retardant, but at least natural fibers because natural fibers will burn. Synthetic fibers will melt onto your skin and that is a bad situation. So what I had done for this one particular performance is um, I actually won an award for it. I had worn what I would consider a fire appropriate costume underneath and it, that will part with black underneath a white and gold and green um, over costume that was literally held together by a fast-burning fire string. So throughout the act, I burnt off my costume, revealing the second costume. I just can't even believe that. Oh, I'm and sorry. Flash just, that's wild. <laughs> oh, my God. You have no sense of fear. This is blowing me away. This is amazing. And Bob, just my when mother. you think she has... She just when you think she hasn't done enough, and of course, again, can I revert back to the beauty? Because yeah, I've just spent five seconds looking at her. Here's a shock, folks. She also 
models as well. No surprise there. Mm-hmm. Of course, she's got the perfect body and the perfect face. I love you. I hate you. I have a love-hate thing going on right now. <laughs> I was just saying this today because I was asked to model, and I've modeled before, but I'm not very good at it because I'm still trying to, you know, at my age, I'm like, yeah, do I even want to model? I was trying to think to myself, am I going to be able to pull this off or not? So you look like a woman who's extremely comfortable being in front of a camera. So, again, I'm big on using my show to educate people about certain things. And, you know, modeling is one of those industries that always has the upside, downside constantly to it. Like you'll hear 50 success stories, and then you have people that come along that are like, you have to be a size 2, you have to be 5'3", mm-hmm. et cetera, et cetera. And it, and it conditions you almost that you're not okay unless the camera is telling you you're okay. You know what I mean, that mentality? Yeah. So mm-hmm. do you uh, – would you encourage people that are up and coming and, and enjoy being in front of the camera to go running right out and be like, hey, you know what, this is something I want to do? Is there always that upside, or have you ever experienced more of a cautionary side to modeling that, that you're not enamored with? I just want to look at it from both sides. Well, modeling, like performing or like acting, definitely has your, your physical presentation is part of what you're selling, and that comes with right. a – host of potential insecurities and unhealthy habits when so much of your value is literally predicated on how you look. That can be extremely detrimental. But the thing that I would tell somebody looking to get into modeling is that modeling is a genre. You know, you have runway models, you have magazine models. These are the people we normally think of when we think model that are six foot two and a size zero. And there's a lot of pressure and a lot of publicity on that. Um, the kind of modeling I do has has never paid my bills, to be fair. I've, I've paid my bills as a performer, sure. but I have modeled. Um, but I do art modeling, and I do performance-based modeling. I'm speaking right now to an author that is looking for an aerialist to be on the cover of her next book. So hopefully, mm-hmm. fingers crossed, I will get that modeling gig. But I am okay. five foot six. I am 145 pounds. I am a size two, but that's just because I'm a performer. And I like to get involved in art projects. So one of the projects I was most proud of, because you can use any of this for good, you can absolutely choose a cause and go for something, is I worked with um, a project called Sucker Punched. And it was it took inspiration from the Sucker Punch movie, and it's all about empowering women. So they do, um, it's by Fight Guy Photography. There's been like four renditions of it. Highly recommend checking it out. But it's um, it's all about portraying women as as warriors and and their individual personalities as the warrior that they want to be. And then all the proceeds go to benefit uh, Rain, which is an organization that helps abused and battered women. So that was a professional modeling gig, but it's not something you're going to necessarily see in a magazine. So I would say that if anybody wants to get into this, definitely consider how much of yourself you're willing to give over to it. And find the projects and the parts that are going to your that are going to be fulfilling for you, and not just the sure. next gig. Oh, I agree with you definitely. In fact, speaking of uh, important and significant issues and agencies, etc., I was going through your social media pages and I noticed how you really put a spotlight on some pertinent different things. Like I saw some of the notations and posts that you put up relative to saving the ocean. You had um, mm-hmm. posted something relative to International Plat Bag Free Day. I was like, okay, talk mm-hmm. to me about that. I was like, I love the idea of that, actually. And so tell me a bit about some of your own pet causes, things that are very, very close to your heart, either nonprofit or otherwise. I always find that it's good to pass along things for people to think about, like, hey, the next time you do this, think about this. So is there anything really close to your heart that you focus on or you want to eventually maybe even partner with, you know, like business to business down the road? Oh, absolutely. So the the two things that I think are biggest for me, and I, I – engage with them both on different platforms is the first one is definitely a female empowerment and sort of overcoming a lot of the toxicity that women in this country are raised for and seeing yourself as a powerful creature that can shoot for your dreams. And I work towards that with um, a, a convention in, in Vegas called combat con. And I work with it through mm-hmm. my mermaiding, trying to empower the, especially the hobbyist community to explore this and see themselves as beautiful and powerful. It's very similar to pole in that aspect. I want, I want everyone to have that experience. So I tend to donate a lot of my time and efforts to that kind of thing. Um, on specifically the mermaid side, having grown up in Panama, the biggest thing for me personally that's near and dear to my heart is the devastation of tropical reefs right now. And specifically the issues around sunscreen and coral bleaching and ocean acidification. 
honestly, my, my dream is to be sponsored by or partner with or work closely with one of these reef safe biodegradable sunscreens that are out there. Um, there's three or four really, really solid brands and I'd, I'd love to partner with one of them and be able to bring their products to my shows and educate and push that kind of thing. Because the thing about the ocean and the water is that everything ends up there. There's no, Oh, I live in Iowa. So like my sunscreen isn't hurting the ocean. No, it it all is. Everything washes downstream. Everything eventually ends up there. And eventually I think what will change the sunscreen coral bleaching issue is legislation like the kind that Hawaii has recently passed banning these chemicals from their beaches. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. And as we've all seen social media publicity, these can be huge vehicles for change. And if I can take what notoriety we've developed as a mermaid company and just find a way to encourage people to switch their products, I think it could help. And I'm just trying to do whatever it is I could to help. I kind of figured that. And and what's lovely about, and that's what I appreciate so much about having, you know, being a journalist or having this platform is you can influence other people and, and throw it out there and, and say, hey, you know, let's make a change at this. And I love how you're using your format and posting this up and saying, hey, people, take a look at this. Hey, people, read this. You know, this is something that's important, et cetera. And so I think that that's pertinent and, and, and very, very important anytime you have the means to be able to influence other people, use it for good, obviously. Um, mm-hmm. I want to ask this before we get into the services that you provide through your company. Um, I don't know if you know this or not, but I actually looked up the definition of a mermaid. We've all heard of what a mermaid is, but if you combine multiple definitions, this is what it is. It sounds like a mermaid is a natural being who has magical and or prophetic powers, who is beautiful, possesses a fish, fish tail, and loves to sing. So I'm trying to figure out how many, Morgana, of these hmm. are you. Do you have magical or prophetic powers? powers because I'm guessing you probably do. <laughs> uh, it depends who you talk to. <laughs> my team would say I do. Uh, my, my team would say that I, I have a bit of a prophetic uh, power when it comes to just being able to see where the market's going and see trouble ahead and, and prepare for, for all of our futures. But honestly, I think that's just because I've lived a very long while in a very short time. And, and that's it's been an incredible education in my short 30 years. So um, as far as loving to sing, I love to do it. I just, you know, if I'm going to do it in public, there's going to need to be a couple drinks at me first. But, hey, karaoke is I knew it. <laughs> and they're done that. And then as far as she's got the beautiful thing, she clearly possesses a fish tail already as far as that goes. And the other thing, too, several. is I've noticed um, – I have noticed this in any case because people like, for instance, I know you've done the Renaissance thing, and I know that a lot of people oftentimes mm-hmm. have their own perception of how mermaids are very mystical and very, you know, we all know the, the stories about some of them. So my question to you is, some people talk about there being a correlation between mermaids and witches. Do you think that's true mm-hmm. in some degree? So, oh, absolutely, because I think that both witches and, and mermaids as a concept, if we boil it down, in both cases we have a – predominantly female archetype that is incredibly powerful and rejected and or abused by human society. So I think there are people who identify very strongly with these, with these concepts and especially the idea of, of power and the idea of being somewhat persecuted by the culture that you're forced to interact with. So I I Mm -hmm. do think there's a, a sort of a sisterhood there. Ah, yes, I would have to agree with that to some extent. And I've heard that a lot, quite a bit, but I do happen to notice that, the de- you know, clearly people pick a lifestyle or a profession, and then when you match up mm-hmm. the definition to them, it's, it's interesting. So I kind of pegged you that I thought you'd be every single one of those people. And so she has perfect, mm-hmm. perfect definition of a mermaid. How cool is that? Um, oh. Now, let's talk about some of the services, but I want to make it clear, folks that are listening in, what we're discussing right now on the mermaid side of things is called circuits, siren, Pod. I don't think I've mentioned that before. She also mm-hmm. has on the flip side, which is similar but not exactly the same. I know you're the founder of Circus Siren Entertainment, which is, you know, a high-end Washington-based talented entertainment agency. So if you would, please, talk to your audience a bit mm-hmm. about what Circus Siren Entertainment does and what you offer through there versus the mermaid side of things, because that's what we've been talking sure. about. So let's do a distinction here. Please talk to us a bit about the agency. 
So Circus Siren Entertainment is is the parent company of the Circus Siren Pod, and that was born very organically out of um, me being contracted for various aerial dance or circus gigs, and then my clients wanting multiple performers. And circus is a small world. I can call up 14 friends that are incredibly adept at their various fields. And I realized mm-hmm. nobody was, was filling this void. So that was the birth of Circus Siren Entertainment, and we offer – just about everything. Um, aerialists, fire performers, uh, jugglers, hula hoopers, go-go dancers, cabaret acts, uh, sword swallowers. If you've seen a circus act, we probably have it. The only request I have not been able to fill to date was a high jump, sh- high dive shallow pool act. And I, I cannot mm-hmm. find one in this or any other green state. But other than that, we've got you covered. <laughs> And then, yeah, the Circus Siren Pod um, is just one piece of that, but it's honestly the piece that has taken off the most and become the most famous. Now most people know that and don't even know that we're part of a larger entertainment company. But uh, they're definitely the part I think I'm most proud of because it's the performers that I've personally trained, and that, that just makes it very special. And we are a team of performing mermaids that span most of the U.S. I have mermaids as far flung as Hawaii and Florida that work for my company. And we do mostly large-scale events, um, corporate events, renaissance festivals, casinos, New Year's Eve events, um, normally large things. We don't typically do like the birthday party mermaid for that. I highly recommend like a princess performing company. They're very specialized in that field. And we are well known for our traveling tanks. We own and operate the tallest travel mermaid tank in the country, as far as I can tell, probably the world. It's nine feet tall and 3,000 gallons. And its name is Albatross. Oh, my God. Listen to this, folks. Mm-hmm. Holy cow. But, so you've got Circus Siren Entertainment over here. So get this. So mm-hmm. she's got that on one side of the fence. She's been featured in the following. I'm going to toot your horn for a minute. So just listen about yourself. Oh, go so for I it. I haven't heard this already. <laughs> she has been featured in Stubborn Magazine, the Washington Post Express, WCCB Charlotte, News Channel 3, CBS News, and Fox 45 WBSF. That's just to name a few right off of the top. Number two, she was mm-hmm. the world championship title owner in 2015. I can't even believe you have. I, you should, I mean, just. Go look at her profile. I, that's all I got to say about the awards kind of stuff. So we've got that going on. And in 2018, she traveled to 11 states, three countries, the District of Columbia, also did, as she mentioned, Renaissance fairs and you name it. She is already, get this, half booked up for 2019. So there's that. Yeah. I mean, listen to the list of accomplishments. And did I mention the beautiful parts, the smart parts, the fact that she <laughs> can do everything and she has no fear? Remember the love-hate thing? Yeah, yeah been- continuing that right there. God, woman. Um, And then there's more. (laughs) So wait, there's more. Okay. So first of all, we've already discovered that she's got the Circus Siren Entertainment. We're currently talking about the Circus Siren pod thing. And if now we want to talk about, I know very recently the Mermagic Con just recently happened, which I know you're the Mm co-founder of. So we're going to talk about that for a second, but I'm curious who won the tail because I know it wasn't me. They did a tail giveaway. Nobody told me about this. I didn't get to win anything. Ouch. Ouch. Shay Monique won the tail. She uh she won ah. in our Instagram contest, and then actually we had a Merlympics at the convention, and we gave away three more professional grade fabric mermaid tails. Oh, how cool so to the Merlympics winners. So there's there's Mermagic Con's full of surprises. So to back up and talk about that, um, I'm one of the three owners and founders. Um, two other small business owners that are also women. They're just incredible to work with. Um, Mermaid Sienna and then Colleen McCartney. Uh, they together own a company called Metro Merfolk, which focuses on teaching mermaid swimming classes and mermaid fitness classes and running meetups and really bringing together the hobbyist community that loves mermaids. And then uh, Mermaid Sienna is one of my performers. She's actually the first uh, mermaid I ever hired uh, outside of myself. So, um, so yeah, she and I go back course. a long way. So the cool thing about this convention is that it brings together all aspects of the mermaid community from professionals from all over the world. We had a speaker come in from Australia uh, who's a professional mermaid out wow. there down to people who have never been in a tail before in their life. We have tails available for rent. We have free classes you can take. And it's all the different parts of this all in one place. 
And is it a one day event or uh, forgive me because I didn't I did not pay attention That's fine. to that one particular detail. Is it one day? Is it an entire weekend? How long? It is an entire did this weekend. Go on the um, this past okay. year we started. We did Friday night through Sunday uh, midday. We tried to do a half day on Sunday to, to allow people to fly. Uh, the demand sure. was honestly truly overwhelming. Uh, we had about twice as many people as we had originally. Um, projected back when this was still an idea floating around in our heads. And so we are expanding the programming next year. Um, Preliminary plans are that it will be Friday night and full days, both Saturday and Sunday, potentially with additional specialty workshops on Friday daytime, maybe. We'll see. We got a year. (laughs) (laughs) You have a year to kind of think about this. And then have you given thought to, is it always going to stay in the same location? Or do you think you might shift it place to place? Because I'm guessing often you guys are floating around doing your thing. You know what I'm talking about? Like place and that's place a big to part play. of why so, it's based in. Um, that's a part, a big part of why Washington. it's in February. <laughs> it's the middle of our gotcha. off season, so we can be here. We have a great relationship with the Freedom Aquatic Center in Manassas. They've always been uh, just wonderful, professional colleagues of ours. So we do intend to keep it there for the foreseeable future. The thing I think that might cause okay. it to move is if we grow at the rate that we're anticipating, there could come the day when we outgrow it and need to pursue some of the new uh, Olympic-style facilities that are being built in the area. But that's probably a couple of years down the road at least. Sure, of course, I understand completely. And kudos to you on that because obviously I, I run a festival myself and I know all full well just how much work it takes and, and how much mm-hmm. marketing and getting people out there. And that's that's a huge thing. And the fact that it's such high demand, that's awesome. And congratulations on that. That's huge. Thank you. Very, very, it's, it's very, really been very a wonderful, wonderful experience. And we do, um, we do have early bird tickets on sale now on Eventbrite. Oh, cool. Just look for Mer Magic Con. That's very, very cool. Okay, now let's get to talking about all the different things that you offer, of course, through these Circus Siren mm-hmm. Pods, because there's different services that you guys have, because that's a, a crucial thing. First of all, I noticed that you are actually hosting a Going Pro Mermaid workshop from November 10th to the 16th yes. in the Dominican Republic. So I'm excited to hear about that, because do you have, uh, you have to be a set age? Do you have to be a set other requirements for this sort of thing? And what sorts of things are they going to learn through this workshop? Tell us a bit mm-hmm. about that. So, um since we are traveling internationally, we can take you as young as 16, but you do need a parent to accompany you to travel as a minor. Um, there's sure. no age limit on mermaiding, even as a professional mermaid. There are mermaids of, of all ages, really. So that part's less pertinent. It really is pointed at people who want to try to make a go of this as a business. So we do we do want to limit it to people who have at least some experience in a tail. They do have to own their own tail. Because the idea is to create a one-stop shop for people who have been hobbyists, who have been doing this for a while, and who want to build their own business out of it, to basically just give them the keys to the kingdom. There's going to be some incredible classes on underwater performance. I'm going to be teaching classes on things like building your business from the legal back end, as well as things like how to source and maintain a tank safely. Um, Lila Jones, who's the owner of Mermaid Dream Retreats, and it's it's her company that I'm working with on this, uh, she's going to be teaching some amazing things about um, interacting with wildlife and uh, free diving skills and things like that. So it's honestly back when I started in 2012, nobody was talking to anybody. Nobody was teaching anybody. It was the Wild West, and now I'm really excited to be part of a one-week-in-paradise Come learn everything you need to know to take it back home and start your dreams. Well, I have to tell you, one of the most impressive things about this is not only is it a six-day workshop, so you're not spending just a weekend. You've got a a, a crucially large amount of time to be able to seek some knowledge. Second of all, I love the Dominican Mm -hmm. Republic. Never been there. I've heard wonderful things about it. Great spot. Great amount of time to be able to learn. I just I love this concept. That's absolutely wonderful. Now, plus the accommodations the are lovely. It's a it's a luxury oh villa with its own pool and a fully stocked bar. So we uh, we tend to work hard. Hello. To play hard. <laughs> I have a feeling Morgana and I would do really well with this whole have a cocktail, have no sense of fear, girl empowerment thing. Oh my God! Wait, absolutely. Um, We've got um, something that you've done, which is, I think this is super neat. You can actually uh, do photo shoots where you have people go in the tank and do photo shoots. Is that correct? So people can actually get Um, in there and do a photo shoot. Exclusively 
at uh, Mermaid Mega Fest. So we did them. Um, Mermaid okay. Mega Fest was launched last year, and we were so honored okay. to be part of it. And yeah, for a lot of professional performers as well as amateurs, but especially professionals um, that are doing this for a living and don't have access to a tank because tank is only one thing that a mermaid can do. There's a million things mermaids can do professionally. Um, It was a chance since we had this windfall of this beautiful tank to give people that opportunity to actually dive a tank and take photos and have something for their press packs for the professionals, but also for the hobbyists have an experience that they really can't get anywhere else. I can't even. I, I just can't even imagine something like a photo shoot like that. That's <laughs> too wild for me. This whole concept is wild to begin with. Now, if I understand you correctly, you when someone calls up and let's say, for instance, they approach you and say, "Okay, Morgana, I want to go ahead and do this sort of event, etc., cetera, etc." Cetera, is it you who assigns a particular mermaid? Do they get to pick their own mermaid? Is there a certain criteria or limit, or how do you figure out how to structure an event when somebody first approaches you? Well, luckily, I have a lot of experience in that area because it definitely was a learning curve Ah. when I first started out doing events. So the big things that I need to know are the logistics. You know, do you want a tank? Do you have a pool? Okay, you have a pool. Is the pool heated? It's not. Your event's Mm -hmm. in April. Okay, we're going to have to have a conversation about that. Um, Sure. So the the first thing is is the logistics of do we have a safe water space or is it a dry space? If it's a dry space, do you want me to bring like a grotto and throne set up or are you providing that? And once we've hammered out the logistics and we get to actual casting, I handle the casting and I do take into um, consideration client request, but clients sure. don't always know the requirements of the job on the back end. I mean, why would they? And their their gig may require a specific skill set. For example, um, while everyone's free diver certified and lifeguard certified, only about half of us are scuba certified. Um, you know, some of them, one of my girls has asthma. So, like, if your gig is going to require scuba and you want that one particular mermaid, I'm sorry, but no. Uh, so of we course. definitely take client requests into, into account, but where you're going to cast based on the right skill level, the right look and feel for your event, and then also availability and location comes into it. If you are in Arizona and you would like a mermaid for your event, well, you can have my mermaid who lives in Arizona, or you can have my mermaid from Pennsylvania, but she's going to come with a travel cost. Gotcha. So, no now we be as accommodating as we are as accommodating as we we can possibly be, but at the end of the day, we have to give you the right performer for the demands of your gig. Oh, of course, that makes perfect sense because everybody needs to be happy and they need to be safe. And of course, obviously, mm-hmm. you want to be entertaining and engaging, but clearly, you have to have these are factors that you're clearly considering. Um, when I was thinking bubble artist, because I saw this and I said to myself, I don't know if most people know this, but bubble artist is a form of artistry, literally, where bubble artists put mm-hmm. bubbles together. I want to know specifically, as it relates to your profession, what is what does a bubble artist do specifically? I know that sounds stupid, but I'm like trying to picture this in a tank, and I'm like, what is she talking about? Oh, it's not so, in the tank. I'm probably <laughs> so, not the only one. Okay. The bubble artist, so bubble artist often refers to two different acts, Um I mean, you could refer to the one that we do more often as a human bubble. But so you have the bubble okay. artists where they do create, you know, large scale bubbles. They blow smoke into bubbles. They blow bubbles into bubbles. It's just an incredible command of, of physics and of their medium. And I do have those available, mm-hmm. but those tend to come from the circus siren entertainment side. What we do more often on the circus siren pause side is literally a human sized bubble uh, that we put a performer mm-hmm. in. It can be a mermaid or it can be a contortionist or a flow artist or, or a dancer of some variety. And that bubble can float across a pool. So now you have, say, a contortionist in the middle of your pool at your gala or whatever floating in the middle of the water as she, you know, puts her ankle behind her ear or does some other incredible feat that I definitely can't do. <laughs> so it's, it's, more, it's a more unique offering. <laughs> Oh, goodness. Okay, yeah, because that sounded mm-hmm. really neat. I thought to myself, that sounds absolutely amazing to me. And then on top of it, she's got this whole water acrobatics thing, and obviously most of us that have gone to an actual aquatic acrobatic show of some kind already know that it's a custom-designed sort of water stage production. And mm-hmm. I'm guessing that yours are 
do you have a number of different shows that you plan out, or do you just cater it to a particular client, or how do you determine what go, what sort of acrobatics you're going to do each day or at each performance? So in our in our nine foot tank, the performers have complete independent control over what they do, and a lot of them are extremely mm-hmm. acrobatic. Uh, Mermaid Katya is one of those who can basically put her ankles on her head, so she'll do these incredible arches where she'll hold her fluke in her hands and Israela will literally swim through like the circle that she's making. So when they're in the tank, it's up to what their individual preferences are and their favorite tricks. And each well, each of us has sort of our, our favorite go-to tricks for our larger sure. scale shows, like things we've done for Hera's casino. Um, we do choreographed acts that are designed to be viewed from the surface. So while uh Wiki Wachi, for example, is an incredible show of, of, underwater acrobatic feats that you view through an aqua theater. So you're looking at a huge pane of glass like you would in an aquarium so you can see them move underwater. The vast majority of our events don't have that same setup. So we've developed um, sort of a hybrid between mermaiding and synchronized swimming. We can't use a lot of the synchronized swimming traditional moves because most of that is upside down with your legs in the air and one we can't separate our legs and two the tails weigh 50 pounds so that's just not going to happen mm-hmm. um so we've <laughs> developed a way to do synchronized swimming shows that are meant to be viewed by people standing on the pool deck looking at us from above and those involve um different formations backflips, different tricks but all that can be seen from somebody having a cocktail at the bar ah Gotcha. <laughs> now, mm-hmm. of all those various different services that you provide, uh, as far as a mermaid goes, let's say for instance, so tell me specifically, the majority of the time, are you doing live performance? Are you working for uh, particular private events? What's the bulk of your business? Where does that come from? I'm just curious. The bulk of our business is various festivals, I would say, closely followed by corporate events. But I think sure. festivals take it. Um, mostly, uh, so between things, you can find us at the Pennsylvania Renaissance Fair. You can find us at the Carolina Renaissance Fair. We're also going to be at Fantasy Wood Festival in Columbia, Maryland, um, Memorial Day weekend. Just the vast, because of our tanks, because we can do these large-scale productions in a, in a mobile way, um, sure. that's what we get booked out for most. And then I'd say that the closest, the close second is corporate events and casinos. I would, I would lump those two together. Absolutely. So now if somebody's mm-hmm. been listening to us and they say to themselves today, I want a mermaid period for whatever reason. Um, what mm-hmm. is the process? Is it normally just, okay, fine. They have to go straight to the website. Do they just contact you directly? And moreover, turnover time, like for instance, from the time they book you, um, mm-hmm. how much time do, basically should they approach you ahead of time before they decide, okay, fine. Meaning they can't, can they call you last minute? Like let's say for instance, I have an event next week. I'm calling you today. Does that work? You know what I'm saying? Right. Mm-hmm. I know what you're saying. So, so we do have a, a big staff. Like I said, I've got 20 performers um, around the country that I can send out. So odds are I can get you a mermaid regardless of when you email me. Um, and that's, so that's the best way to contact us officially. You can go through the website, just shoot us an email, tell us a little bit about what you're trying to do, and that way we can prepare some packages for you. Um, but the the difference in booking us last minute versus booking us uh, six months in advance, and please, please book us in advance. It, it honestly <laughs> will make everything so much easier, is that if you book last minute, I may not be able to offer you the tank you want. I may not be able to offer you the particular artist you had your eye on because odds are they're already booked. And it may become more expensive because if all five artists I have in the state you live in or that your event is in are already booked because they've been booked for six months now, I can still get you a mermaid, but I'm going to have to bring her in from Florida. And so that's obviously going to be more expensive. I'm yet to have an event where I just could not provide anyone it just becomes a matter of if you want specific performers, if you want to keep your costs down, the further in advance you book, the better your situation will be. Of course, that makes perfect sense. And I see uh, very recently, not so long ago, you had open call auditions. So I'm guessing that means the future will more expansive for you along with other things. Um, I don't want to forget to mention that. First off, uh, mm-hmm. if you are looking for upcoming events for this young lady, I know that April 12th and 13th, you're at the Pirate Fest, which is in Greenville, North Carolina. And then May yes. 25th to the 27th, you're at the Fantasy Wood Festival in uh, Columbia, Maryland. 
Um, so yeah, mm-hmm. uh, that's my only other question is plans for expansion. What where is both your entertainment company as well as your Circuit Siren Pod? Where do you envision that a year from now? What are your goals when it comes to that? Well, um, number wise, uh, our our business, our contracts uh, quintupled between 2017 and 2018. So I definitely see it growing further. My goal for 2019 um, is to double our business, and we're we're looking like we will get there. Pretty much all of our former um, customers have, have rebooked for this year, and we're adding more almost daily at this point. Um, the year is going to book out very, very fast. And I think in the wonderful dream world where Morgana gets – everything she ever wanted. I'd like to make this, well, I mean, it is full-time for me, but I'd like to make it full-time, not just for me, but for as many artists as want to make that life change. And, and that's ah, really what I'm looking for going forward is, is this year versus last year is huge. Last year versus the year before was astronomical growth. So I definitely see it going that way. But my goal is to, to put it one way that I love to put it, um, when I applied for my new passport and they asked for application or occupation, I put mermaid. And I want <laughs> the rest of my performers to be able to do that too. <laughs> that is so awesome. Absolutely. Well, okay. Mm-hmm. So now we have reached, oh, my God, can you believe we've been on here an hour and 20 minutes? Literally. I cannot. <laughs> you are just wonderful This to happens all with. the time. Oh, thank you so much. But, I, you know, I'm always amazed by the fact that I just get so enthralled with talking to somebody. I won't lie to you, and, and I'll share this with my listening audience. You you wouldn't know this, but one of the things that I remember very, very, and I'm sure there's lots of girls out there with the same sort of thing, I never really had a, a childhood that was filled with going to do these fun things, you know, going to circuses and seeing mermaids and all this stuff. And I told my partner not so long ago, I said, the one thing you could do for me is to, to take me somewhere where I could, you mm-hmm. know, I, and almost 50, I, I'm almost reverting back to, I would love to have a moment in time where I was a, I was a child, you know, where I, where I did these simple mm-hmm. little things. And, and so I was like a child saying to myself, oh, my God, I get to interview this mermaid that I probably would have never seen or this person who was in a circus that I would have never seen as a child. So I'm reverting back to that whole thing. So it truly it was a thrill. And when I get enthralled in paying attention to things like this, and, and I have like 50,000 questions, and you're fascinating on many levels. Of course oh, the time just go by so quickly. I'm like, oh, my God, she's probably thinking this girl's a freak. I'm really not. I'm just really, really Oh, not at all. Um, definitely. So I'm going to, um, just a couple business things. First of all, to your uh, followers and fans, as well as to mine, about two hours after this episode is finished, we will go ahead and we will archive it, in which case um, I'll have a link from Blog Talk Radio for you, along with a link from YouTube, so that this way, you have both of those that will be accessible to you so you can go back and post those up on social media. And otherwise, I do not want to forget to mention Kelly Carnes of Carnes & Company. Without Kelly, we would not be here today because Kelly was kind enough after I, I, I saw a little pitch that she put out there about you. And I said, oh, my gosh, absolutely, yes. Put my hand up. She tried to orchestrate our event multiple times. So, Kelly, I think you are absolutely fabulous yourself. She's Amazing. a goddess. W- yeah. Oh, my gosh. www.carnes and dot co go visit kelly i'm telling you right now top notch 100 percent pretty professional that's what i call her so kelly thank you so much for everything um the lady we've been talking to today her name morgana and that's spelled m-o-r-g-a-n-a the last name is alba remember she is the founder of the circus siren entertainment circus siren pod and of course the co-founder of mermagicon which we talked about earlier today so here we go these are all the various ways that you can find this young lady Two different websites, CircusSirenSirenENT.com. Those are two websites. She is on LinkedIn. She is on YouTube. Reddit.com, R-E-D-D-I-T dot C-O-M. Two different Instagrams, which is CircusSirenPod and CircusSirenENT. And then on Facebook, she has CircusSirenPod, as well as your personal. uh, Is is Mm -hmm. your entertainment company on Facebook as well, correct? Uh, technically, yes, but it is not like a monitored that, and, and yeah, main yeah. page. It's, it's there that's, so that people can link it yeah. for employment purposes. That, that's what I thought. Okay, so I didn't want to mention mm-hmm. that because I was like, yeah, I don't want to direct somebody yeah. to somewhere that, where they shouldn't be going. Are there any other places where people can find you? Um, no, I think you covered them. I would say that the, the best place to find us is definitely the Circus Siren Pod Facebook page. Um, that's definitely the most active 
And then my, my personal page is just Morgana Alba Circus Siren. And um, those are the best ways to keep up with, with what's going on and see the announcements. And starting in about a week, we'll start listing our public shows for the mermaids on that pod page. So you can see where we'll be. Uh, I can tell you right now it looks like we're going to be in Virginia, Pennsylvania, North Carolina, Michigan, South Carolina, maybe? That might be North Carolina. I'm trying to think. Um, <laughs> so we're, okay, fine. We're, there's definitely shows coming to all over the Mid-Atlantic that are publicly available, and they'll get listed on the Circus Iron Pod Facebook page. Oh, my gosh. Look at that. Okay. So now you've probably not had an opportunity to listen to my show before, but if you have not, you're in for a treat because I'm going to tell you what you're missing. Uh, why? Because okay. we've reached the end of the show, and that means two things. I don't know if you knew this or not, but there are always surprises on my show. Did you know that? You don't get out I did of the not show know that. without getting surprised. Well, you're about to get surprised, so I hope you're sitting down. <laughs> so that's number one. Uh, I do two different things. I get to surprise the uh, the guest, and then number two, at the very end, I get to tell you what I think of you. And the reason that I do that is my audience <laughs> has grown to know this. I, I kid you not. It's true. Let me tell you why. Because everything you just heard is scripted. I am I am a live, working, breathing journalist. So I did all this research mm-hmm. on you, and I write that. But the, the part where I tell you what I think of you is completely non-scripted for a reason. That means it's not conjectured. I didn't write it. It's just, it's, well, it's off mm-hmm. the heart pretty much. And people get a sense of Aww. who you are then from my eye. So I think that's important. But let's get to the surprises first because, you know, what I've noticed, publicists love this. And not only do they love it, but the guests love it. And I'm like... If I have the ability to give you something and get you all riled up and excited, it gets me all worked up. So here we go. Today, it would appear as though Morgana has done almost everything except a few things that I do. So the number one thing that I thought about was, a woman like you, why have or have you ever been in a film before? I have not. Well, do documentaries count? (laughs) Morgana, is that a film? Because of it, I is, mean, yes. it's not out yet. But I, we were okay. interviewed. The owners of Mermagicon were interviewed for a documentary that's forthcoming on conventions that also includes things like AwesomeCon. Ah, okay. but it hasn't got it. been so, released. Okay. So, okay, I gotcha. So it's not out there as of yet. So you haven't had a documentary <laughs> done about yourself. You haven't had a documentary done about the mermaids. No. Et cetera, et cetera. If I'm not getting you right. Okay. Well, sit down because something's about to change in your life. One of the things that I do, because I have quite an extensive resume, well, that's what my partner tells me and others. Anyways, uh, <laughs> one of the big things on my list is is that I am a filmmaker, and it occurred to me today that one of the best ways that people never realize that they can get exposure is, well, let's just plop you in a movie. So, Morgana, I have two options for you here. Number one, I find what you do to be fascinating. So, you know, what we could do is we could film ourselves a little documentary about your little mermaids. If that doesn't work and you're not happy with that, then I would be more than happy to take you, take all of your mermaids, and plop you right in the middle of my movie, which I'm currently shooting. That, uh, Are you breathing? I, no. I might actually be kind of speechless here, and that doesn't happen to me. Um that, that would be amazing. That time. would be. <laughs> I'm. I can like. I can. I can virtually hear the screaming uh, excitement of my team already. Um. Definitely option <laughs> number two if if I get a choice. But oh my, that would be incredible. So you, so you want that, the whole. You want the whole gang to be in the, to be in my movie. And I will tell you, oh, I'm absolutely. the luxury. The luxury I have is that I'm I'm filming more than one film, which is a good thing because then I give you options as far as that goes. But. The thing that I'm thinking of is we have this production called The 100 Looks of Love, and, and it is literally a personification of all sorts of things that people love in the world, whether it's people, places, the whole nine yards. And you, as a mermaid, represent what a good number of children love, which is whimsy and fantasy mm-hmm. and fun. And even as adults, women, what they envision themselves wanting to be, this beautiful goddess dressed up. To me, you personify what I'm trying to get across, and that is love, love of something, whether it's a person, place, or otherwise. So I'd be honored if you and your gang would be would be kind enough. That, to that be would in my be movie. incredible. Well, you oh my gosh, me. that's not an easy thing to do. <laughs> well, I'm not done yet. Um, oh my God. There's more. Okay. Are you okay? Please don't pass yeah, out. I'm, I'm not quite I'm done, but I'm almost there. Shock. Okay. Okay. Well, you should be. That's exactly why I do this because people don't see it coming. Number two. Luckily for me, uh, my second home, which is which is uh, 
where someone very special lives, is in New York City. And so I spend a good portion of my time working there. One of the things that I have been blessed to do is to run uh, my own film festival. I've been doing this for the last three years. So by right, Mm -hmm. because you are now going to be in a film, that gives you the option to not only come and speak at my panel, or I should say speak at my film festival, but you could actually perform at my festival in New York City. Would you want to come and do that? Oh, my God. Yes, absolutely. Oh, that, wow. Wow. That would be amazing. God, this is kind of scary. I mean, people get all riled up on my show, but I'm afraid you're going to pass out or cry on me. So, I okay, so those are the... I don't I don't normally do that, but um, it's getting there. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. So that's that's the number two thing, and I and I do these sorts of things on the show just because of the point of I don't I normally don't always get an opportunity to give these opportunities to everybody who comes on the show. You just happen to fall mm-hmm. along the guidelines of of you're a performer and you're a performer that does her job very well and gets across the country. So I know we have to work the logistics of it out because the, um, yeah, the actual festival is likely going to happen in August this year. So we'll go have to line <laughs> and figure out how we can work all that out. So that's number two. That is my absolute busiest month, but I will make it happen. <laughs> oh my God. And she's all right. We'll, we'll work out the details off air. The number three thing, mm-hmm. the only other thing that I can offer you which hopefully will be okay. I don't know if you had heard at the beginning of the show, but myself and my partner actually have have aligned and uh, we've produced a company, an actual clothing line. And one of the things that we're doing is we're doing a tour called Film and Frock. We're going city Mm -hmm. to city to city, and I'm doing some live interviews, and I'm showing some cinema, and then we're doing um, uh, modeling of the clothing, et cetera. So I was wondering if we happen to be in the same city you guys are in, if you would mind coming and literally just... Another good way to promote yourselves, you guys can plop yourself up right up on stage. You can wear the clothing, and you can and not only that, advertise your own mermaid stuff while you're at it. Because we'll be all we, over the we place. would be honored. We're literally going to Vegas. We're going here. We're going there. So I'm like, you know what? Let's just pull together and do all sorts of business. I hope that that was enough Absolutely. for you. Those are all three of your surprises. Um, <laughs> so the last thing I want to do is to um, before you die. <laughs> Or I, I, on I might just go die of happiness. Yeah, please don't. Like please don't. Oh, <laughs> goodness, you're too kind. So let me just wrap up my show by telling you what I think of you, um, and then I'll let you get to your evening because I'm sorry I've kept you so long, but some of the best ones oh, no, are worth no. waiting for. Definitely. So here we go. So Morgana, let's talk about her. So these are my impressions of her. As I mentioned earlier, this is not scripted, so this is me right off the cuff. One of the first things that I knew that I liked about you was there are just certain people that you see or that you look at for face value before you even start to research them and you realize that they have a glow about them. You are one of those people, not because you're a mermaid or a performer or you're an aerialist or all of these things, but because of the fact that I only see this glimmer of just sheer happiness and overall contentment by those people who are actually professionally employed in the area in which they dream of being in. You, my dear, are a walking dream post. You're like a sandwich board for dream makers. Um, one of the nicest things that I saw in your face was, I, I believe that you are very sincere. I believe that you are very significantly polished when it comes to your professional life. I believe that you do not walk on a stage without being 125% fully prepared. I believe that when you walk on stage, your number one priority is to please your audience, even more so than pleasing yourself. I do see a small twinge of self-doubt every once in a great while, but that's so very endearing to see a woman who is so empowered to do so many things and yet still have this small small bit of themselves that's just a wee bit wondering, hmm, are they going to love me? And what she doesn't really realize is, is if I go back and I showed my audience all the pictures of all the different people that you've made happy, that you've made smile, that you've made sob in a good way, you probably don't realize the impact that you have every time you either step into a tank or step onto a rope or step onto a ride or step anywhere you go. You impact lives. It's not because you're female and it's not because you're necessarily a performer. It's because you live and breathe, from what I can see, virtual kindness and completeness, and you are very, very gifted. That is not something that happens to everyone all of the time. So I'm so very glad that you decided to come on my show. I feel very blessed that you gave me the amount of time that you did. I'm very in awe of what you do and how you do it and how you take such precautions to protect yourself and those that are involved. So I commend you completely for everything that you've done. I'm so looking forward to being able to film you, and I so hope that you come back to visit me again. That's it. Really intent on making me cry, huh? 
<laughs> yeah, it happens a uh, lot. You know, that, what can I That say? might be one of the most beautiful things anyone's ever said to me. Thank you. Oh, my God. Well, you do have a husband, honey, so don't tell him that. He'll probably get I mad do. at me. But he's very, he's uh, very short on words. Strong <laughs> silent type. Boy, I can relate. <laughs> oh, do I get that. So, yeah. So we have a date in a couple different places here. So I will make sure I follow up with you uh, after we get off of social media or after we get off of air, et cetera. We'll sum everything up, put things together. Please, as I said, don't be a stranger. We'll have to coordinate some schedules, and certainly uh, you're more than welcome oh, absolutely. to come back. Absolutely. Wonderful. Uh, All right, young lady. Thank you so much. <laughs> Anytime, dear. You have a good night. I'll be talking to you soon. You too. Thanks. Thanks. Oh, goodness. Let me just say, I really, really hope that I was actually making her happy and not miserable. Again, that beautiful, wonderful lady, Morgana Alba, A-L-B-A. She, again, is the founder of Circus Siren Entertainment, Circus Siren Mermaid Pod, or actually Circus Siren Pod, forgive me, and, of course, the co-founder of Mermagic Con. One more time, websites are Circus Siren Entertainment. Excuse me, Circus Siren ENT dot com, along with Circus Siren POD dot com. She's on LinkedIn. She is on YouTube, Reddit dot com, and of course Circus Siren Pod and Circus Siren ENT on Instagram and Facebook. And of course, you can look her up on her personal Facebook as well. One more time, again, Kelly Carnes with Carnes and Company. Thank you, thank you so much for this wonderful guest. www dot C-A-R-N-E-S-A-N-D dot C-O. Please go ahead and look Kelly up. She's been in the field for a number of years, and I cannot thank her enough for all the work she does for people like myself because some of the best guests make for some of the best shows. So thank you so much. And a reminder again, April 12th and 13th at the Pirate Fest in Greenville, North Carolina. And May 25th to the 27th at the Fantasy Wood Festival in Columbia, Maryland. Thank you so much to everybody that took all the time to listen in today. I'm truly, truly appreciative of all of you. As you know, I say this all the time, but thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Last note here, I'm going to be on air Friday, International Women's Day. I'm not telling you who the guest is. It's a special guest in honor of International Women's Day, and it's one woman that I admire more than I can tell you. That's all I'm saying. And last of all, of course, we have Joshua Boyes at 10 o'clock Central Standard Time on Saturday. You guys, I am off to nurse my sore throat finally. I cannot thank you enough for being here and, and sticking with me. You guys have a great night, and I'll talk to you soon. Take care.